Hi everyone, this is Sister Moyo and welcome to another episode of Moyo Math. Today we're going to be looking at the June 2022 paper 1 CSEC Mathematics Examination paper. All questions will be fully explained, but before we get into it, don't forget to share, like and subscribe to my channel. Alright, so let's go. So question 1 states, uh, negative 3 in brackets all squared plus negative 2 in brackets all squared is equal to, so we have question 1, negative 3 in brackets all squared plus negative 2 in brackets all squared. This is negative 3 by negative 3 plus negative 2 by negative 2. And this becomes negative 3 by negative 3 will be positive 9 plus negative 2 by negative 2 is positive 4. And 9 plus 4 will give us 13 whose answer for question 1 is D. Let's move on to... Question 2. Question 2 states, what is the value of the digit 2 in the number 48.621? So we have this number 48.621 and the value of the digit 2, any digits are to the point, we're looking at tens, we're looking at hundreds, so 2 will represent hundreds and we're going to simply write it as 2 all over 100 whose answer is E. Let's look at question 3. Question 3 states, what number when added to 1 and a third gives a 2? So question 3, so we're looking at what number when added to 1 and a third gives a 2. So let's call that number x. So x plus 1 and a third is equal to 2. So we want to determine what is this number x. So to find x, we we'll simply 2 subtract 1 and a third. x is equal to 2 subtract. We can convert this mixed number to a proper fraction. 3 by 1 is 3, plus 1 is 4 over 3. And we can simply subtract these two fractions by finding the LCM, which is 3. 1 into 3 is 3. 3 by 2 will give us 6. Subtract 3 into 3 is 1. 1 by 4 will give us 4, and when we subtract 4 from 6, it gives us 2 terms, whose answer is B. Question 4 states, so let's look at question 4. The next term in the sequence, 1, 6, 13, 22, 33, is, so we have question 4. So we have the sequence of numbers 1, 6, 13, 22, 33, and we want to determine what is the next number. So if we look at the pattern, 1 to 6 will be obtained by adding 5, 6 to 13 will be obtained by adding 7, 7 to 22 will be, sorry, 13 to 22 will be obtained by adding 9. Uh, 22 to 33 will be obtained by adding 11. And if you look at the pattern, we have here um, odd numbers. So we have 5, 7, 9, 11. And the next odd number will be 13. So 13 plus 33 will give us 46. So that number in the missing space will be 46, whose answer is a C. So let's move on to question 5. Question 5 states, if 30% of a number is 45, what is 4 fifths of the number? So 30% of a number, let's call the number x, so 30% of an of means to multiply of some number x is equal to 45. So you want to determine what is 4 fifths of the number. So we need to find the number first and then we can multiply that number by 4 fifths. So this is the same as 30% 30 30 over 100 multiplied by x is equal to 45. We can reduce this two zeros cancel, we get 3 over 10. And 3 over 10 by x can be written as 3x all over 10 is equal to 45. This here is a simple equation where we have one fraction on the left, one fraction on the right, which will allow us to carry out the process of cross multiplication to remove it from the fractional form. 1 by 3x will give us 3x, 10 by 45 will give us 450, and therefore to get x by itself 
we're going to divide both sides by 3. And when we divide 3 into 450, we're going to get 150. And therefore, we can now find 4 fifths of this number. So this number 150 represents x, and therefore, 4 fifths of 150 will give us 5 into 5 is 1 and 5 into 150 will be 30 and 30 by 4 will give us 120 so the answer for question 5 will be B let's look at question 6 so question 6 A certain amount of money shared in the ratio 2 to 3 to 9. If the difference between the first and second share is 40, then the amount of money shared is. So we have a, a certain amount of money to be shared in the ratio 2 to 3 to 9. So the difference between the first and the second share. So this is our first share, second share, third share. So the difference between the first and second share, let's look at the proportional part. If I subtract 2 from 3, this will give me a difference of 1. So 1 proportional part is equal to that difference is $40. So it states uh, what is the amount, total amount of money shared. So the total amount of money shared is linked to the total of your proportional part. So if one proportional part is equal to $40, then total proportional parts will be 9 plus 3 is 12, and 12 plus 2 will give us 14. So 14 proportional parts will be equal to multiply 14 by $40. So when we multiply 14 by $40, that will give us uh, $560, whose answer is D. So the total amount of money shared is $560. So the answer is D. Let's look at question 7. Question 7 states, so we can have a set question here. If P is equal to, we have the elements 235, Q the elements 236, S the elements 2, 4, 5, then what is P? That symbol then means intersection. So P intersect Q intersect S. So we're looking at question 7. So we have three uh, subsets. So we want to determine what is P intersect Q intersect S. So of course we know intersection simply means elements that are common to all. So if you look, the only element that is common to all will be 2. So our answer for question 7 will automatically be A. So let's move on to question 8. So question 8. We have here a Venn diagram. So item 8 refers to the following Venn diagram. The shaded area represents what? So this shaded area, this is a region outside of a uh, set P. So therefore, if we have to determine or identify the shaded region, the region outside of set P will be known as P complement. That shaded region will be known as P complement. P would have the stroke at the top right of P and that is denoted by A. So question 8, A. Let's move on to question 9. So question 9 states, the elements of the set, and we have that solution set, x is such that 6 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 10, where x is an integer. Ah, so we want to determine what are the range of values that lies within the given uh, solution set stated. So we have here 9. We have x is such that 6 is less than or equal to x, which is less than 10. So for us to determine the range of values, what are we going to do? Now, what we can do here is simply uh, separate this solution set into two, two um, inequalities. This will be 6 is less than or equal to x and x is less than 10. That is us separating it into two inequalities. 
And with inequalities, it's always important to ensure that your node is on the left side of the inequality symbol. So you have x is less than 10, x is on the left. But let's make sure that uh, for this inequality, x is also on the left. So we can simply switch, we can write x, we can write 6. But what will also change will be the inequality symbol from less than or equal to to greater than or equal to. And of course, we have x less than 10. So let's represent these two inequalities on a number line so we can clearly identify what elements lie within the range. So we have here, um, we have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. X greater than or equal to 6 means we are focusing on 6 and everything that is greater than it. So you can have 6, I shade this region, but that circle which will indicate we are including 6 and we're looking at everything else that is greater than 6. So we're looking at 6, 7, 8, but of course we have X less than 10. So X less than 10, I have an unshaded circle which means I'm looking at numbers less than 10. And of course, those numbers less than 10, we're considering 9, 8, 7, 6. So the numbers or elements that lie within the uh, range of the solution set, we're looking at 6, because we must consider 6 is x greater than or equal to 6. So 6, 7, 8, 9, and of course, we have x less than 10, so we're looking at 9, 8, 7, 6. So we're looking at these numbers here, or these elements which will lie within the range. So we're looking at uh, uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, whose answer is uh, B. So question 9, B. So let's move on to question 10. So question 10. So item 10 refers to the following information. We have again two sets. One is M whose elements are PQR, the other is N whose elements are PQ. Which of the following statements is true? M is a subset of N, so this is all because M cannot be a subset of N. All the elements of M are not in N, so that's definitely out. Uh, M intersect N is equal to N, so we're going to check that shortly. M union N is equal to N. So if we combine all these elements of M and N, clearly will not be equal to N. M intersect N is empty. So if we show the intersection, we have elements common to both. So obviously if they intersect, it cannot be empty. So let's, let's highlight if B is the answer. So M intersect N is equal to N. Now N, all the elements of N are in M. So it means that N is a subset of N. So we can simply show from a perspective of a Venn diagram, if I have here a circle which represents M, I'm going to draw another circle inside of M which represents N. And this is done because N is a subset. Once we have one set being a subset of the other, then we simply show one circle inside of the other circle. And the elements of N are P and Q. The elements of N, of M, sorry, are also P and Q, but we must include as well R. So R will be in that region. So if you look clearly, P and Q are common to both M and N. P and Q represents N. So clearly, the intersection of M and N, which are elements common to both M and N, will be the elements of N, P and Q. So, B is certainly correct. M intersect N is equal to N, whose answer is B. So let's move on to question 11. So question 11 states, refer items 11 refer to the following information which describes three sets. So we have three sets here, P, prime numbers, Q, odd numbers, R, even numbers. Which of the following sets is empty? So we know an empty set is a set where we have no elements. Uh, so if you look, P intersect R, so let's first identify the elements which are prime, we know prime numbers, 
and numbers that can only be divided by itself and one starting from two. So we have two, three, five, seven, uh, 11, 13, and so on. We have odd numbers. Odd numbers are numbers that cannot be exactly divisible by two starting from one, uh, one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, dot, dot, dot. We have even numbers. Even numbers are numbers that can be exactly divisible by two. So we can have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, dot, dot, dot. So we want to determine if which of the following sets are empty. So clearly we have P intersect R. So if you look at P and R, clearly we have two common to both uh, P and R. So that is not empty. We have P union Q. So if I show the union of P and Q, simply I'm combining all these elements without repetition of elements. So uh, the union is not empty of P and Q. P intersect Q. So we have P and Q, the intersection. Yes, we have elements common to both P and Q. And the last, we have Q intersect R. If you look at Q and R, we have no elements common to both. So therefore, the intersection of Q and R are empty. So for question uh, 11, the answer here will be Q intersect R, whose answer is D. So let's look at question 12. Question 12. How many students play exactly one game? So how many students play exactly one game? So exactly one game for question 12, we are looking at uh, this region here. This region here, which represents that the two games are, we have tennis, we have cricket. So the region showing exactly one game will be this region which denotes tennis only. This region here, of course, is cricket, and we have uh, um, cricket and tennis. So we have cricket and tennis. This region represents the intersection of both sports. So this is definitely out. But this region here represents those students who play tennis only. So tennis only, we're going to have how many students? One, two, three, four students. The answer for question 12 will be four students whose answer is C. So question 12, C. Let's move on to question 13. So question 13. A dress which costs $180 is being sold at a discount of 10%. The amount of the discount is, so you want the discount and discounted price. So that's all the mix of the two. So your discount, it's 10% of the cost of the dress. So 10% of $180 will be 10 over 100 multiplied by 180. Two zeros go, zeros go, so I'm left with what? $80. Whose answer to the discount, the answer there will be C. Let's look at question 14. So, question 14 states the price of a refrigerator is $1,850. If sales tax, sales tax of 5% is paid on the cost of the price of a refrigerator, a buyer who purchases the refrigerator will pay. Uh, by cash will pay. So let's determine what will be uh, the amount this person who is uh, buying the refrigerator will pay for this refrigerator. If it's one, if it's one thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars, a sales tax is uh, added. Then certainly that sales tax will be what? Let's determine the sales tax. It's five percent. So five percent. Of the cost price, which is one thousand eight hundred and fifty, let's find five percent of that. So that's five over one hundred times one thousand eight hundred and fifty. So what are we going to get? My two zeros go. This will be five into five, one five into ten is two, and two into 
185. Of course, 2 into 18 is 9. 2 into 5 will be 2. Remainder 1, which becomes a half, and we can express that as a decimal. So it's $92.50 will be the sales tax. The amount we are going to now add to the refrigerator cost, so we can tell you what is the total cost paid by the customer. So therefore, um, the total cost, which will be the price of the refrigerator, the cost price, plus the sales tax of $92.50. So we're going to get here a total of 0.52. 9 plus 5 is 14. 8 plus 1 is 9. So $1,942.50, whose answer is D. So let's move on to question 15. So question 15 states, a salesman sells a car for $11,000. If he is paid commission of 4.5% for the first $10,000 and 7.5% on the remainder, then the commission he receives. So we know that uh, commission is a percentage of the, of, of the selling price. So in this case, he's selling cars. So what is his commission? So he gets 4.5% on the first ten thousand dollars so let's take that ten thousand from the eleven thousand um, dollars that the car was sold for so this will be his commission let's start with four point five percent so four point five percent of ten thousand dollars which will be four point five divided by 100 multiplied by 10,000. So we know our two zeros will cancel, two zeros will cancel. That is 4.5 multiplied by 100. So that will give us 4.5 by 100. We move our point two places to the right and we're going to get 450 dollars. So the commission on that first 10,000 dollars will be uh, 450 dollars. But then it says 7.5% on the remainder. So he gets a commission of 7.5% on the remainder, and the remainder will be $1,000. So therefore, uh, the remainder, so we're looking at 7.5% of $1,000. So that will be 7.5 over 100 by 1,000. So of course, the two zeros cancel, two zeros cancel, and that is 7.5 by 10. We move this decimal point one place to the right, so we're going to get $75. And therefore, the total commission, his total commission, will be $450. Plus seventy-five dollars, and that will give us. This is five. Seven plus five is twelve. Two and four plus one will give us five. So five hundred and twenty-five dollars. Whose answer is B? Question sixteen. The value of a plot of land is eighteen thousand dollars. Land tax is charged at a rate of seventy cents per one hundred dollar value. What is the total amount of tax paid for the land? So for us to determine the question 16, the amount of tax paid, what we have to do is first determine how many $100 value we can obtain from $18,000. So the uh, so number of $100 value from $18,000 will be equal to simply to divide 18,000 by 100. So when our two zeros cancel, we're going to get uh, 180. So we know we can obtain 180, $100 value from 18,000. And if land tax is charged at 70 cents per $100, then to determine the uh, total amount of tax paid, so therefore tax paid 
will be to multiply 70 cents by 180. So 70 cents by 180 will give us, let me check my calculator so we can easily speed up the process. We're going to get $126 will be the tax payment. Let's look at question and oh, that answer, that answer is B. Let's look at question 17. So question 17. A man's basic wage of 40, of a 40 hour week is $160. He is paid over time at the rate of one and a quarter times the hourly rate. If he works six and a half hours over time in a certain week, his wage for that week is. So if you have to determine the man's wage for that week, the man's wage for that week comprises of his basic wage plus uh, his overtime wage. And for us to determine that, of course, we must note that uh, the basic wage plus overtime wage is known as a gross wage. So his gross wage. Will be equal to his basic wage plus his overtime wage. Now his basic wage we have his basic wage is one hundred and sixty dollars for that forty hour a week. So we have his basic wage. But first, to determine his overtime wage, we have to know that overtime wage. is determined by taking the overtime rate which is how many hours he would have worked overtime by the number of hours worked overtime so it's going to be the overtime rate is hourly rate multiplied by the number of hours worked overtime so how do we determine this man's overtime rate. So to determine the overtime rate, we have to first know what is the basic rate. And the basic rate, and I'll look into the side here, the basic rate is simply taking the basic wage, which is $160, and we're going to divide it by the number of hours we work for the week, which is 40 hours. So we divide 40 into 160, we're going to get 4 dollars which will be how much money he earns per hour so that's his basic rate so it's four dollars so for us to determine what is the overtime rate and normally when you are paid overtime you're paid more per hour so to determine the overtime rate we're going to take the uh one and a quarter times the hourly rate which is four dollars and that will help us to determine what is the overtime rate so the overtime rate will be one and a quarter times four dollars and we're going to multiply that by the number of hours work for that week number of hours work over time for that week which is six and a half hours so this becomes uh, five over four times four multiplied by six twos are twelve and one is thirteen on over two so when our twos four two fours cancel out we're going to get five dollars so the overtime rate will be now five dollars. So we know it's certainly more than the basic rate of four. So the overtime rate is now five dollars, and we can multiply that by the number of hours worked for us to determine how much money this guy is paid over time. Okay, over time. So it's going to be uh, thirteen over two by five over one, which will give us sixty-five all over two. When we divide 2 into 65, we're going to get $32.50. So this man would have worked overtime and would have obtained um, an overtime wage of $32.50. So what then is his gross wage? How much money did this man earn for the week? So we're going to take this basic wage of 160 and we're going to add it to the uh, overtime wage of $32.50. Which will work out to this becomes uh, one hundred and ninety-two dollars and fifty cents will be his uh, uh, money earned or wage earned for the week. 
whose answer is uh, D. Let's move on to question 17. Question 18, sorry. So question 18, we have here, at the end of any year, a car is worth 5% less than what it was worth at the beginning of the year. If a car was worth $9,500 in December 2016, then its value in January 2016 was. So question 18. So we have here the value of the car at the beginning of the year, which is January 2016, we don't know. So in January 2016, the value we don't know, but it's a brand new car, so let's consider that in terms of percentage, 100%. So 100% is equivalent to we don't know the price of the vehicle. So I'm just going to put a line to indicate the price of the vehicle at the beginning of the year. So at the end of the year, in December 2016, obviously, uh, as a car hits the road with the wear and tear, the value will depreciate. So in December 2016, the car was valued at 95%, and of course, the value is now 5% less in terms of percentage, 5% less than what it was worth at the beginning of the year. So at the beginning of the year, it was worth in terms of percentage, 100%. So if it's 5% less, then it becomes what? 95% at the end of the year. So 95% is equal to $9,500. So what we can do is create a proportional relationship for us to determine what is the value of the vehicle at the beginning of the year. So simply, we take 95% is equal to $9,500. We find for 1%, which is $9,500 divided by 95, and 100% will give us $9,500 over 95 by 100, and this will give us 95 over 95 is 1, and 100 by 100 will give us 1 with 4 zeros, which is $10,000. Whose answer for question 18 is C. Let's look at question 19. So question 19 states, a loan of $8,000 was paid back in 24 equal monthly installments of $400. The rate of interest on the loan was. So for question 19, if we have to determine the rate of interest, it is very important for us to know initially the formula for simple interest. So we know that simple interest, I is equal to principal by rate by time one over 100. I'm going to put I over 1. For us to get a rate by itself, we go to cross multiply. So we cross multiply 1 by PRT, we give us PRT, and 100 by I gives 100 I. So we cross multiply to remove it from a fractional form. So to get the rate of uh, interest uh, as a subject, we have to remove P and T, so we're dividing both sides by, by the uh, principal in time. This will be 100i all over pt. So let's see what information we have to substitute into that formula so we can determine what is the rate of interest. So we know that p represents the principal, which is the amount of money uh, that was borrowed, 8,000. Uh, i is the interest. So how do we determine the interest? So the interest, it's simply if the loan was $8,000 and it was paid back in 24 equal monthly installments of 400 means uh, 24 times 400 will be the amount paid and when you borrow money from the bank, you're not going to pay back $8,000 exactly, you always pay back $8,000 plus interest. So the amount repaid, you're going to subtract from that the principal which is 8,000. So the amount we paid is 400 by 24 which is 9,600 dollars and when we subtract the amount we borrowed of 8,000 from 9,600 the interest will be 1,600 dollars. 
So the interest on that loan is 1600 so that substitute into our formula so we can determine what is the rate. So this will be 100 multiplied by the interest which is 1600 over the principal which is $8,000 times the time, so we have to be very careful. It's the rate of interest, the annual rate. So therefore the annual rate of course will be one year. So what we're going to do is save one year. So the annual rate of interest, the yearly rate of interest will be one year. So we use one year, not, you see 24 months and some may use two years. So it's the annual, yearly rate of interest. So when we go to the sum, we're going to get what? Two zeros go, two zeros go, um, zero, zero go, eight, 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 one, eight to the 16 is two, and two by 10 will give us 20%. Whose answer for question 19 is D? Let's move on to question 20. So question 20 states, at a sale each book was marked $3 off the original price. Daniel paid $46 for the two books that had the same sale, sale price. What was the original cost of one of his books? So, for question 20, we have here the cost of the two books. So, cost of two books, right? After uh, the mark price of the mark $3 off was, was taken from the original price, uh, the cost of those two books was $46. So therefore the cost of one book, cost of one book will be to divide $46 by two. So the cost of one book is $23. And if, this is the cost of one book, and if uh, a mark $3 was taken off the original price, then we're going to add $3 to our $23 so we can determine what is the original price of one book. So therefore, the original price of one book will be to add $3 to $23, which will give us $26, whose answer is D. Let's move on to question 21. Question 21 states, 3x squared multiplied by 2x to the power of 3 will be, so 21, so we have 3x squared multiplied by 2x to the power of 3, so we're applying here our law of multiplication of indices, what we can do is multiply the two coefficients, 3 by 2 will give us 6, and x to the power of 2 by x to the power of 3, once you're multiplying, and you have the same base, you keep the base, and you add the powers. So the law of multiplication of, it, of indices, which will give us 6x to the power of 5, whose answer is the E. Let's look at question 22. If 5 and in brackets, 2x minus 1 is equal to 35, then what is the value of x? So question 22, we have 5 in brackets, 2x minus 1 is equal to 35. So our first step is to remove brackets. We're going to multiply 5 by each of the numbers or terms within that bracket. So it's going to be 5 by 2x will be 10x. 5 by negative 1 is negative 5. is equal to 35. So we have expanded or removed the brackets. And now let's solve for x. So I'm going to remove negative 5 by adding 5 to both sides, so it's going to be 10x is equal to 35 plus 5, 10x is equal to 40, and I can now divide both sides by 10 to give me x as 4, whose answer for 22 is d. Alright, let's move on to question 23. So question 23 states, when twice a certain number is subtracted from 7 and the result is multiplied by 3, the answer is 33. What is the original number? So, for question 23, 
Let x be the original number. So x original number. So in order for us to determine what is that original number, it states when twice this certain number, the original number, is subtracted from 7. So twice this original number will be 2x. This is twice original number. And if that is subtracted from 7, it's going to be 7 minus 2x. And then this result after I subtract 2x from 7 is multiplied by 3. So I put in brackets 7 minus 2x. And of course I'm multiplying that by 3, which is placed outside of the bracket. And the answer is 23. What is the original number? What is x? So simple equation for us to solve. So this will be 3 by 7, 3 by negative 2x. 3 by 7 will give us 21. 3 by negative 2x will give us negative 6x is equal to 23. And of course, we're going to solve this equation. So the negative 6x is equal to 33 minus 21. Negative 6x is equal to 12. And we can divide both sides by negative 6. And therefore, x is negative 2. So the answer for question 23 is B. Let's look at question 24. So question 24. Given that 3 asterisk 6 is equal to 12 and 2 asterisk 5 is equal to 9, then A asterisk B may be defined as. So which one of these expressions will represent A asterisk B? And this is a question uh, which falls on the topic called binary operations. So 24. So, 3 asterisk 6 is equal to 12. So let's use trial and error. Let's go with D. D we have 2A plus B. So we are going to allow 3 to be A. So let A be 3 and B be equal to 6. So using the expression 2A plus B, 2A plus B means I'm going to replace A with 3. So it becomes 2 times 3 in brackets. I'm going to replace b with 6, so I'm going to get 6 plus 6, which gives us 12. So clearly we've shown so far that 2a plus b looks like the expression we are going to use for a asterisk b. So let us try now 2 asterisk 5. This is equal to 9. So using the same expression, 2a plus b, uh, we're going to let a be equal to 2 and uh, b be equal to 5, so therefore 2a plus b becomes 2 times 2 plus 5, 4 plus 5, which is 9. So it shows that 2a plus b is right, and therefore the answer for question 24 is d. So let's move on to question 25. So question 25 states, if x is negative 2, y is 3, t is 2, then x over y all to the power of t is, so 25. We have here um, x is equal to negative 2, y is 3, t is 2, x over y all to the power of t will be, we replace x with negative 2, we replace y with 3, all to the power of t, which is 2. So this is negative 2 thirds all squared, which is negative 2 thirds by negative 2 thirds, which will give us positive 4 all over 9, whose answer is b. So let's move on to question 26. So question 26 states, If 3 to the power of 2x plus 1 is equal to 9 times 3 to the power of x in brackets, then the value of x is. So we have 3 to the power of 2x plus 1 is equal to 9 in brackets, 3 to the power of x. What we have is an exponential equation where the unknown, of course, is raised to a power. So x is a power. And to find x, what we have to do is uh, uh, try our best to get 
single terms of the same base on either side of the equal sign. So we want one term of base 3 on the left, which we already have, and we want one term of base 3 on, of base three on the right, which we don't have. So to help us to achieve that, what are we going to do? So we leave 3 to the power of 2x plus 1 as is, and on the right, we are going to convert 9 into 3 squared, and of course this is 3 squared times 3 to the power of x. So to get one term of base 3 on the right, we're going to apply our law of multiplication of indices. So this becomes 3 to the power of 2x plus 1, and this is 3, once you have the same base and you're multiplying, you add the powers, 2 plus x. And once we have one term of base 3, in this case on the left, one term of base 3 on the right, we can simply equate the powers. So equating the powers, what are we going to get? We are going to get 2x plus 1 is equal to 2 plus x. So I solve this equation. This is 2x minus x. 2 subtract 1. x is equal to 1. Whose answer is C. So let's look at now question 27. So question 27. Given that A, so we have a matrix question, A has elements 1, uh, 3, negative 3, 3, 0, 5, then 3A is equal to what? So we have this uh, 2 by 3 matrix. So for 27, A, we have 1, 3, 3, 0, negative 3, 5. So therefore, for us to find 3A, it's simply to take that scalar, which is the number in front of A3, I'm going to multiply by each one of these elements with a matrix A. So 3 by 1 will give us 3. 3 by 3 will give us 9. 3 by negative 3 is negative 9. 3 by 3 is 9. 3 by 0 is 0. 3 by 5 is 15. Whose answer is A. So let's move on to question 28. So question 28 states, the determinant of the 2 by 2 identity matrix is, so the first thing you need to recognize is, what is an identity matrix? So an identity matrix is a standard matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1, otherwise known as a diagonal matrix. And to find the determinant of that matrix, we have to know what is the formula for the determinant of a matrix. So, my two parallel lines on either side of I represents the determinant and the formula is AD minus BC. So we know A in this case will be 1, B is 0, C is 0, D is 1. So let's substitute into our formula. This is 1 times 1 minus 0 times 0. So we're going to get 1 times 0, which is 1. Whose answer for question 28 is A. Question 29. So let's look at question 29. So question 29 we have. Items 29 we put to the following vectors P and Q. P, the column vector is 3, 7. And Q, the column vector is negative 2, 5. So they want us to determine what is the vector P minus Q represented by? So this is P, uh, subtract Q. So it's going to be P, whose column vector is 3, 7, subtract Q, whose column vector is negative 2, 5. So a simple case of subtracting two column vectors so is going to be first element, subtract first element. I will make sure we put negative 2 in brackets. And this is second element, subtract second element. So you're going to get a minus by a minus is a plus. 3 plus 2 is 5. 7 minus 5 is 2. So we end up with 5, 2. whose answer is a C. Let's move on to question 13. So question 13.
Right, we have a vector question. Item 13 refers to the following parallelogram WXYZ. In the parallelogram, vector XY is equal to U and vector XW is equal to V. So the magnitude of our uh, XYZ, which we see, and the magnitude of vector XW is V, which we see. Now, another important piece of information R is the midpoint of YZ. So, we see R as the midpoint. And what midpoint means? It means that R will divide that vector YZ into two equal vectors, which will be YR and RZ. Good? So, they want us to express vector WR in terms of U and V. So, the magnitude of WR in terms of U and V. So, the first thing, when dealing with vectors and treating with a parallelogram, we must understand with all vector quantities, we must show uh, direction and magnitude to represent our vector. And for a parallelogram, the two opposite vectors are equal and parallel. So it means that this vector WZ will move in the same direction as that of XY and the magnitude of WZ will be U. Similarly, uh, vector yz will move in the same direction as xw and the magnitude of yz will be v but because r is the midpoint r is the midpoint of yz it means that r will divide that vector yz into two equal vectors they will be yr and rz and what we will also do is divide the magnitude of that vector yz in half. So therefore the magnitude of y's of, of yr now becomes a half v and the magnitude of rz will also be a half v. So I will set up and identify all that is of importance. Let us now find the magnitude of the vector WR. So first I must connect or draw a line from W to R and on that diagram that doesn't become a vector unless I place the direction and of course I have to find the magnitude. So my direction will be from W to R. And what will come into play here is the use of an important law called the triangle law. So the triangle law is implemented when one vector follows another, when two vectors move in the same direction so we look, we see WR follows RZ, they both move in the same direction. So what we can simply state here, um, in a triangle WRZ, using the triangle law, once two vectors move in the same direction, they follow each other, we add them. So we see WR follows RZ, so we can add WR, vector WR, to vector RZ. Once we use the triangle and we implement this process, the two inner letters are always the same, and we connect the outer in that order from W to Z to give us what we call a resultant vector. So for us to find what is required, which is vector WR, it means we have to make WR the subject. So to do so, I'm going to subtract RZ from both sides. So it becomes WZ subtract RZ, vector RZ, and therefore vector WR will be equal to vector WZ, which is U, subtract vector RZ, which is a half V. And our answer for question 30 is E. Let's look at question 31. Given the 1 millimeter is equal to 1 over 1,000 meters, then 2,500 millimeters in meters is. So for question 31, if 1 millimeter is equal to 1 over 1,000 meters, then 2,500 millimeters is equal to 1 over 1,000 times 2,500 
And what's going to happen? Clearly, two zeros go, two zeros go. And when I divide 25 by 10, that will give you 2.5 meters. So the answer is uh, B. That's the second question 32. Question 32. The volume in cm cube of a cube of edge 3 centimeters is. So for 32, you know the volume of a cube, volume of cube is simply side by side by side or side cube. So if, if each edge is 3 centimeters, then you know this will be what? 3 cube or 3 by 3 by 3, which is 27 cm cube. Whose answer is C. The second question, 33. So 33. The perimeter of a square is 48 centimeters. What is the area in CM squared? So for question 33. So if you have a square, all four sides are equal, and the perimeter is 48 centimeters. That's called one side x. Then we know if all four sides are equal, then the perimeter will be 4x, and that will be equal to 48 centimeters. So we know we, know we can determine x, x which will be equal to 4x divided by 4, 48 divided by 4, x is 12 centimeters. The length of one side is 12 centimeters, and having found the length of one side, then the area of that square is simply what? Side by side? Or side square, so that's 12 by 12, which is 144 cm squared. Yeah? Whose answer is D? So let's look at 34. Question 34. So 34 states. The area of our trapezium PQR above is. So we have this trapezium, so 34. And we want to determine what is the area of a trapezium. So a trapezium consists of two parallel sides, call one A, call the other B, and a perpendicular height. So for us to find the area of this trapezium, the formula is a half times A plus B by the perpendicular height. So we know that this will be a half times A, which is 8, plus B, which is 18, times the perpendicular height, which is 5. So this is a half times 8 plus 18 will give us 26, times 5, 2 to 2, 1, 2 to 26 is 13, and 13 by 5 will give us 65 centimeters square will be the area of that trapezium whose answer is B. So let's look at question 35. So question 35. So item 35 refers to the following diagram which shows a sector. So a sector, a slice of pizza, a slice of cake of a circle AOB. AOB, the sector angle, this angle here is 60 degrees and the radius OB is R units long. So this is the radius OB which is R units long. What is the area of sector of um, area of AOB, that sector AOB? So 35. So to find the area of sector AOB. So the area of a sector, because it is not the entire circle, it's a fraction of the area of a circle, then the area of the sector is uh, to take the area of a circle and we're going to multiply by the fraction, fraction of the area, which is theta all over 360. Theta being the sector angle, which is 60 degrees. So this is A is equal to pi r squared times 60 over 360. A is equal to pi r squared times, you can simplify, zeros go, zeros go, 6 into 6, 1, 6 into 36, 6. It becomes 1 6 of pi r squared, so we can write it as 1 6 pi r squared, whose answer is A. 
Let's look at question 36. So 36. Items 36 refer to the following diagram which shows a compound shape made up of a rectangle and two identical semicircles. One on either side of the short side. Uh, the perimeter of the figure above in terms of pi is. So they want us to determine the perimeter of uh, that figure above. So perimeter means distance around. And uh, what we can do in terms of our semicircles, we can determine what's the radius of, uh, of each semicircle. So if this is 15, uh, we can subtract 15 from 27. 15 from 27 will give us 12, and we can divide 12 by 2. So you know that this distance from here to here will be 6 centimeters. From here to here will be 6 centimeters. Right? Consider this to be the center of your semicircle. Center of your semicircle. And if it's a semicircle, a line drawn from the center of the circle to the circumference is known as the radius. So we know that this here is the radius of this semicircle. This is the radius of that semicircle as well. And of course, 6 plus 6 will give us 12, which represents the diameter of the entire circle if you bring both semicircles together. So for us to determine the uh, perimeter of this uh, shape, what we can do, we can consider bring both semicircles together to make a full circle. So we can find the circumference of a circle and we're going to add the circumference to our two lengths, each being 15 centimeters. So let's get the circumference of the circle. So circumference of the perimeter of uh, the compound shape will be equal to uh, circumference of circle plus 15 centimeters plus 15 centimeters. We know the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r uh, plus 15 centimeters plus 15 centimeters. Uh, the radius, we know the radius is 6 centimeters. So this is 2 times pi times 6 plus 15 plus 15, which is 15 plus 15, which is 30. So you're going to get 2 pi by 6, which is 12 pi plus 30. But then if you look at your options, we don't have 12 pi plus 30. What they would have done here is a little bit of factorization. So we're going to factorize this expression here by taking out 6 as our highest common factor. And when we divide 6 into each term, 6 into 12 pi gives 2 pi. And 6 into 30 gives 5. So it's 6 into 2 pi plus 5, which is the same as C. So if you have 6 into 5 plus 2 pi or 2 pi plus 5, they'll both be the same. So question 36, C. So let's look at question 37. So 37. The area of a rectangle is 53.6 cm squared. If the length is multiplied by 4 and the width is half, then the area would be. So we have the area of a rectangle, the area of a rectangle is the length by width, and that is 53.6 cm squared. But it's saying that the length is multiplied by 4. So let's consider the length L. So we multiply that length L by 4. And the width is half, let's consider the width W, so that's a half W. The width is half, the area will then be, so the area of this rectangle with the length multiplied by 4, and the width half will be 4L times a half W. 4L times a half W gives us 2LW, and of course the length by the width, this is length by width. We know it's 53.6 cm squared, so you can simply multiply 2 by 53.6 cm squared. When we multiply that, we're going to get 6 by 2 is 12, uh, 3 by 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7, 
5 twos are 10, so we're going to get 107.2 cm squared will be the area of this rectangle whose length is multiplied by 4 and which is half, whose answer is C. So let's move on to question 38. I can state here before to the following diagram, which consists of a triangle resting on a square of side 5 centimeters. If the height of the triangle is 4 centimeters, what is the total area of the figure? So, total area of the figure this comprises of a triangle, so the area of a triangle will be divided by height over 2 plus. We also see a square whose area is side by side. So we know that the base of this triangle, because it is a square, then the base of this triangle is also 5 centimeters. So we know that this here is your base 5 times the height 4 divided by 2 plus the area of your square that side by side, 5 by 5. So we're going to get here. 5 by 4 is 20, 20 divided by 2 is 10, plus 25, which will give us 35 centimeters squared, whose answer is uh, A. So let's look at question 40. Question 39, sorry, question 39. So question 39. All right, so we're looking at a question involving statistics. Items 39 and 40 refer to the following frequency distribution, which shows the average mass in kilogram of a group of children in a school. The number of children who have a mass less than or equal to 40 kilograms is. So you have your mass and frequency represents the number of students. So we're looking at the number of children whose mass is less than or equal to 40. So less than or equal to 40 in terms of mass will be, looking at this region, so students, number of students who have a mass less than or equal to 40 will be 40 and 20. So number of children, number of children with mass less than or equal to 40 kilograms will be equal to 40 plus 20, which will be 68 uh, children, whose answer is D. And let's look at question 40. So, items 39 and 40, so we'll refer to this um, frequency table. Items 40 refer to the following frequency distribution, which shows the average mass in kilogram of a group of children in a school. So, the upper boundary of the median class is. So with this question, we have to be very careful. We're not going to uh, evenly distribute. And what is at the middle, we're going to call that the median. You know, we are accustomed to doing that when it comes to raw data. But this is, this is group data, data on a table. So when it comes to finding median, the approach is different. So what we're going to do, I'm going to convert this table from its horizontal form to a vertical form. So this is a mass 21 to 30. Uh, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 60, 61 to 70. And we have the frequency, which is, uh, of course, represented number of students. We have 28, we have 40. We have 12, we have 34, we have 18. So when it comes to group data and finding the median, what we have to do now is create what we call a cumulative frequency column. So we're going to create a column mark cumulative frequency, which is formed by simply starting with the first number the frequency column, which is 28. 28 plus 40 will give us uh, 68. 68 plus 12 will give us 80. 80 plus 34 will give us 114. And 114 plus 18 will give us 132. 
So 132 represents your total frequency. And therefore, if you have to find the median class, right, uh, or the median mass, then that will be the upper boundary of the median mass. Then you're going to use to find the, uh, the median mass. You're going to use this formula. Position of median will be formed by using a half times n plus 1. So that will be the position of the median. So this will be a half times n, of course, will be your total frequency, which is 132. If you add up everything in the frequency column, you're also going to get 132. So it's going to be 132 plus 1, a half times 133. A half times 133 will give us 6 twos are 12, and 113, 6 twos are 12, and 113. So we get 66 and a half position. So the 66 and a half position, of course, we look at our cumulative frequency column, which helps us to locate the position of the median. So 66 and a half occurs between the 28 and the 68 position. So that's the 66 and a half occurring between the 28 and the 68. But what we can do is approximate the 68 position. And the 68 position will allow us to have a median mass of 31 to 40. So the median mass, the median mass is 31 to 40 kilograms. And we want the upper boundary of the median mass. So you have your upper class limit of 40. So the upper class boundary will be 0.5 more than that upper class limit. So the upper class boundary, which I write as uh, UCB or upper boundary in this case, I'll put upper boundary UB will be 40.5. Whose answer is B? Let's move on to question 41. So question 41. Mrs. Clark arranged the 15 test scores of her students in order of size and selected the eighth score for reporting purposes. Which of the following statistical measures did Mrs. Clark obtain? So for 41, so we have 15 test scores and she selected the 8 score. So we have 15 test scores, uh, 1 to 15, and she selected the 8 score. The 8, right? For us to determine the 8, what represents which of the following uh, statistical measures represent the 8, what we can do is let's check to see if it corresponds to median. So uh, the position of median. Is formed by using the formula half times n plus 1. We have the, um, we want the, 15th, the 15 test scores were arranged by the teacher, so that will represent n, so that's 15 plus 1. So the total number of test scores, which is n, 15 plus 1, so that's a half times 16, which will give us the 8th position. Yeah? So the eight score or eight position will indicate to us that this here is the median. So the median. So this formula here helps us to locate the position of the median, and the eight score will identify what is the median score. So we can have the median. So that answer is D. So let's look at uh, 42. So 42, the pie chart below shows how a student used 12 hours of study English, Math, French, and Geography. The amount of time spent studying mathematics is approximately, so mathematics here, this is 90 degrees. So if a student used 12 hours to test the study all those subjects, we know we can create a proportional relationship here. Uh, the full circle is equal to 360 degrees. So we know 360 degrees is equal to 12 hours. So one degree will 
to be 12 hours or 360 degrees and therefore ought to determine what are 90 degrees equal to in terms of hours. 90 degrees will be 12 hours over 360 by 90. So we know 12 into 12 is 1, 12 into 360 is 30, and we can simply say 30 into 90 will give us 3. So we have 3 hours whose answer is C. That's a good question. 43. If the mean of four numbers, 8, 4, 8, x, and 12 is 10, then what is x? So we have the, so the mean of four numbers, so we know the mean is to uh, find the sum and divide by the total number, right? So find the sum of all your observations and divide by the total number of observations. Our observations are, we're going to find the sum, 4 plus 8 plus x plus 12, we divide by the total number of observations, which is 4, and that mean is equal to 10. So what we have here is an equation which can help us to simply solve for x. So this is 4 plus 8 is 12, 12 plus 12 is 24, so we have 24 plus x over 4 is equal to 10. We can cross multiply. We have single fractions on either side, so that can be applied, so we are, we're going to get here 24 plus x by 1 will give us 24 plus x, and 4 by 10 will give us 40. Or we can simply multiply both sides by 4 if you want to do that as well, and therefore we're going to get here x is equal to 40 minus 24, and 24 from 40 will give us 16, whose answer is D. So let's look at question 44. Question 44. So items 44 refer to the following table, which shows the result of a survey of 100 persons, two from two major ethnic groups, P and R. Respondents were interviewed about their attitude towards mathematics. A respondent is selected at random. What is the probability that he has a positive attitude towards mathematics? So we know uh, we want to determine probability, so 44. So probability is the number of ways an event can occur over the total number of possible ways. So the number of ways an event can occur over the total number of possible ways. So the number of ways in which respondents have a positive attitude towards mathematics from the ethnic groups, two major ethnic groups. So the ethnic groups are P and R, and the number of ways in which a person can have a positive attitude would be 25 plus 12, which is 37 ways. So we have 37 ways, which is the number of ways in which the event can occur, number of ways in which persons can have a positive attitude, all over the total number of possible ways, which will be 100. Yeah? So that answer there is B, which is 0 0.37. Yeah? So let's move on to uh, question 45. So 45. The point where a linear function crosses the horizontal axis, so your 45, this is your horizontal axis, otherwise known as the x-axis. So when a linear function, which is a line that is sloping, crosses the x-axis, then what is going to happen, which is your horizontal axis, then that is known as your x-intercept. Whose answer is? E. So that's your x-intercept. This is your x-intercept. Let's take a question 46. So 46 says, 
The equation of a line which passes through the point 0, 5 and has gradient of 4 is. So for us to determine the equation of a line, so the equation of a line we use y is equal to mx plus c. And for us to find the equation of a line, we know we need to find a value for m and c. m representing your gradient, c is the y-intercept, m the gradient, we already know which is 4. But to help us to find c, we're going to use a point on the line, 0, 5. And how do we utilize that point? This is your x value, that's your y value. So we're going to replace y in your formula with 5. We're going to replace m with 4. We're going to put in brackets. This is m multiplied by x. So we should put x, the value represented x, in brackets 0 plus c. So we're going to get 5 is equal to 0 plus c. c is equal to 5. And therefore, the equation of that line will be y is equal to 4x plus 5 whose answer is a C. Let's look at question 47. Which of the following graphs represent a linear function? So for question 47, pretty straightforward, a linear function is a line which has a slope and of course a y-intercept. So clearly we're looking at this line which has slope and also has a y-intercept. So the answer for 47 will be A. So let's move on to question 48. So 48, the coordinates of the maximum point on the function y equal to 4 minus x squared. So clearly it is a quadratic function whose coefficient or number in front of x squared is negative, which will indicate a curve that is concave down, so therefore it has a maximum turning point. And the coordinates of the maximum point will be x will be 2 and y will be 4. So the coordinates will be 2, 4, whose answer is A. Let's look at question 49. A line L is parallel to the line 3x minus 7y minus 9 equal to 0. What is the gradient of the line L? So we have 49. We have this line L. And it's parallel to another line who has an equation 3x minus 7y minus 9 is equal to 0. So they want us to determine what is the gradient of line L. So when two lines are parallel, their gradients are the same. But we can find the gradient given the equation of a line. What we need to do is make sure it is expressed in the form y equal to mx plus c, where y is the subject. And once we make y the subject, then we can easily determine what is the gradient. So we're going to take this equation and we're going to make y the subject. 3x minus 7y minus 9 is equal to 0. This will be uh, negative 7y is equal to positive 3x comes across to the right as negative 3x. Negative 9 comes across as positive 9. And what we're going to do now is uh, divide both sides by negative 7. Negative 7, 1 over negative 7. Negative 3x plus 9 over negative 7. Two negative 7s cancel out. We're going to get y is equal to. And what I can do at this point is separate it so I can get, in, get it in the form y equal to mx plus c. So I'm going to write negative 3x over negative 7 plus 9 over negative 7. So y is equal to positive 3 over 7x minus 9 over 7. So therefore the gradient of this line m is equal to 3 over 7. That's the gradient of the line m which is 3 over 7. And because both lines are parallel then the gradient of the line L is also 3 over 7, whose answer is C. So let's look at question 50. If g of x is equal to 7x minus 3 in brackets all over 5, then g of negative 6 is equal to, so question 50. We have g of x is equal to 7x minus 3 all over 5. Then what is g of negative 6? 
So it means when we see x in that expression, we're going to replace it with negative 6. So this will be 7, negative 6 in brackets, minus 3 over 5. So we'll simply replace x with negative 6. 7 by negative 6 will be negative 42, minus 3 all over 5. Negative 42, negative 42 minus 3 will give us negative 45. And negative 45 over 5 gives negative 9. Whose answer is A? Let's move on to question 51. Question 51. The range of F is such that X is mapped onto X cube for the domain negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1 is. So for question 51, we have here our uh, function, which is F, is such that X is mapped onto X cube. We have our domain, which represents your X coordinates, and I can set up here a mapping diagram so you can see things clearly. This is negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. This is my domain represented by X, and my range is what I want to determine. So what am I going to do? So to determine my range represented by Y, I'm going to substitute my domain into my function. So where I see X, I put negative 2 cube, and negative 2 cube will give negative 8. Let me substitute negative 1 into my function for X, negative 1 cube. Negative 1 cube is negative 1. Negative 1 is equal to negative 1. When it's 0, 0 cube will be 0. So when it's 1, substitute 1 into our function. 1 cube will be 1. And when we substitute 2, 2 cube will be 8. So therefore, our range will be represented by negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8, whose answer is D. Let's move on to question 52. So question 52, we have here, which of the following pairs of lines is perpendicular? So question 52, we know when two lines are perpendicular, it means that they meet each other at a right angle. So we have these two lines and they meet each other at right angles, they are perpendicular. And we need to know, uh, first of all, two lines are perpendicular, if I know the gradient of one line, and I find the gradient of the other using what you call a negative reciprocal and I multiply these two gradients I'm supposed to get negative 1 so for example, let me take two equations if I have, let me take uh, let's, let's use C and let's see if C will give us our result and C will be the result and let's prove why that's the case if we have Y is equal to minus 4X plus 10 that equation is in the form Y equal to MX plus C and from the equation of a line, we can determine what is the gradient. The gradient is that number located in front of x. So the gradient, once y is a subject, and y is a subject in this equation, the gradient here n is negative 4. Let's take the other equation. We have 4y is equal to x plus 1. So in order for us to find the gradient, we must ensure y is a subject, y stands alone. So let me remove that 4 from in front of y by dividing both sides by 4. So y is equal to x plus 1 over 4. I'm going to separate it by writing this as x over 4 plus 1 over 4. x over 4 can be rewritten as y is equal to a quarter x plus a quarter and therefore the gradient is that number located in front of x. So the gradient m is equal to a quarter. So I have the gradient of both lines, and what I'm going to do now is multiply the gradients, and let's see if we're going to get negative 1. So therefore, negative 4 by negative by a quarter, sorry, will give us negative 1, which will prove that those two lines are perpendicular. The answer is C. So let's move on to 53. So question 53, 
If the sum of interior angles of a polygon is four right angles, then the polygon is so any polygon with four right angles uh, clearly is a quadrilateral, and we can think of a square, we can think of a rectangle, and therefore our answer for this question, straightforward, will be D. Quadrilateral. Let's move on to question 54. Item 54 refers to the following diagram of a transformation. Which transformation maps PQR onto P prime, Q prime, R prime? So PQR is our object, P prime, Q prime, R prime is the image, and the form of transformation that allows us to map uh, the object onto the image will be reflection. So we have our mirror line drawn, and PQR when it is reflected above that line to P prime, Q prime, R prime, we see that the image is a flip of the object. And clearly that will identify reflection whose answer is B. So for question 54, reflection. Let's move on to question 55. So 55, Items 55 refers to the following diagram of an isosceles triangle. In the triangle, the value of x is, so when you have an isosceles triangle, the two base angles are equal, as we can clearly see in that diagram. So for us to find x, x will simply be equal to 180, the sum of triangles of a triangle gives 180, and we going to subtract from 180 the sum of the two base angles, 30 plus 30 is 60, and 60 from 180 gives us 120 degrees whose answer for question 55 is C. Let's move on to question 56. Question 56. Uh, item 56 refers to the following pair of similar triangles. The length of MO. So you want to find the length of MO. So we have similar triangles, similar triangles are equiangular, meaning three angles of one is equal to three angles of the other. And what we can clearly see, ABC is an enlargement of MNO. So therefore, we know that our knowledge of the scale factor will come into play, which is applicable to enlargement. So for 56, we have to determine the scale factor. So the scale factor is denoted by K, and the scale factor is the image length over the object length. The image length, of course, will be AB. Let's go AB, and its corresponding object length will be MN. So, the length of AB it is 6 cm, the length of MN it is 3 cm, so when I divide 3 to 6, my scale factor is 2, which will indicate that this triangle is twice, uh, triangle ABC is twice triangle MNO. It means that the length of MN will be double, multiplied by 2, right? So if I multiply 3 by 2, I'm going to get 6, and if the length of AC is 7, it means I'm going to divide 7 by 2, which will give me 3.5. So therefore, we can state the length of MO will be to divide 7 by 2, which is 3.5 centimeters, whose answer is C. Let's move on to question 57. It says, the image of the point P12 under a translation is P prime negative 5 negative 4. What is a translation vector? So for us to determine the translation vector, we know for translation 57, your formula is object plus translation is image. Your object is P, which I'm going to convert from a row uh, vector to a column vector, so I'm going to write it as P 
1, 2, plus the translation, which is what we need to find the translation vector, and the image, P prime, I'm going to convert that into, move from a row to a column vector as well. This is negative 5, negative 4. And therefore, for me to get translation T, it is going to be uh, P prime minus P, which is negative 5, negative 4, subtract 1, 2, and that will be negative 5, subtract 1, and negative 4, subtract 2, which will give me negative 6, negative 6. Whose answer is E? Let's move on to 58. A plane is flying in a direction of 45 degrees and changes course in a clockwise direction to 135 degrees. The angle through which the plane turns is. So for us to determine the angle through which the plane turns, this is a bearings question. So if it's a plane, a plane must fly from somewhere, let's say from the airport. So for 58, let's assume the plane uh, flew from the airport. A, let's call it A. And with bearings, we must always set up a north line in order for us to show the bearing or angle. We set up our north line. Every node will have a south, east and west, and for a bearing, we must move in a clockwise direction from the north line. So if it's 45 degrees, let me assume this is 45 degrees, so I'm using 90 to guide me, and this is my plane, P, whose bearing is 45 degrees from the north line. So it states now that uh, the plane then changes course in a direction of 1 to 5 degrees, so another bearing. So if it changes course, let's show our bearing on 1 to 5 degrees and show our change of course of that plane. So I set up my north line at P. Every node will have a south, east, and west. Of course, these lines I can move after I've shown the bearing. And I'm going to move in a clockwise direction from the north. This is 90. Let me assume 135 is somewhere around there, all right? So this is my plane now moving in that direction. So I'm going to call this P1 and I'm going to call this P2. So they want us to now determine the angle through which this plane turns. So the angle through which this plane turns is represented by this angle here. And for us to find that angle, we must understand with bearing some important angles will come into play with the lines that are parallel. So you see two north lines, those are two parallel lines. And the angle that will come into play here will be when you have two parallel lines and we observe this box shape, these two interior angles must add to give 180 degrees. If you know one, you can easily determine the other. So in this case, your two north lines are parallel. This is your box shape here. And we can find this angle by simply subtracting 45 from 180, which will give us 135 degrees. Yeah? So don't forget to put your bearing of 135 from uh, the question. And therefore, what we can do is determine the angle through which the plane turns. So we're going to simply now add 135 to 135 and we're going to subtract it from the full circle 360 degrees so therefore this will be so the angle through which the plane turns will be 360 degrees subtract 135 plus 135 which is equal to 360 degrees minus 270 and that will give us 90 degrees. So the angle through which the plane turns is 90 degrees. Whose answer is B? Let's move on to 59.
a surveyor sets up his instruments 12 meters from the foot of the building and records the angle of elevation at the top of the building. An estimate of the height of the building is obtained by calculating what? So we want to determine an estimate of the height of this building. So this is the height of our building here. So this building will comprise of the surveyor's height, which is 1.6 meters. And what we want to do is to determine what is the remaining height of the building. So this is where we're going to use uh, tricks to assist us. We have this rectangle, triangle here. This height from the uh, building to the surveyor it is 12 meters. What I'm going to do is to pull out that triangle from the diagram, so we can have 59. So this is my triangle. This is 40 degrees. I have my right angle triangle. This distance here showing the distance of the building to the surveyor it is 12 meters. And we need to determine the height, the remaining height of the building. So, using trigonometry to assist us, the side opposite the acute angle is known as side opposite. The side opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse, and the remaining side is the adjacent side. And what trick function are we going to use? We circle the side we need to find, which is opposite, and we circle the side with given information for, which is adjacent. And what trick function thinks opposite and adjacent? Tan theta. So tan theta is equal to side opposite or what side adjacent? Tan theta, of course, will be 40 degrees is equal to your side opposite, which is what you want to find, all over your adjacent, which is 12. So I'm going to put tan 40 over 1, I'm going to cross multiply. When I cross multiply, I'm going to get 1 by opposite is opposite, is equal to 12 multiplied by tan 40 degrees. And therefore, we know that the remaining height of the building will be 12, Tan 40 degrees, and therefore the total height of the building, therefore total height of the building, will be 1.6 plus 12 tan 40 degrees, whose answer is B. Let's look at question 60. So question 60, item 60 refers to the following diagrams. We have this diagram here, and the diagram above shows that the angle of depression of the point x from z is 30 degrees. If x is 10 meters from y, the height of y is z in meters is. So we know the angle of depression is when you stand at a height, and you will always have that horizontal line of sight. When you look down, then the angle between the horizontal line of sight and the downward line of sight is your angle of depression, which we see here. So this is my horizontal line of sight, this is my downward line of sight. The angle between those two lines of sight is my angle of depression, which is 30 degrees. But again, we know that when two lines are parallel, some important angles will come into place. So when I have two parallel lines, and I have this Z shape created known as alternate angles, then this angle here is equal to that angle. So I know I'm seeing my Z shape here. So this is 30, this angle here is also 30 degrees. And if that angle is 30 degrees, we take that right angle triangle, I can use trigonometry to help me to determine the height of YZ. So let me pull out that triangle. So I'm going to have YZ. And this is 30 degrees. So for me to find y is here, and this is 10 meters, because this is x, I'm going to use trigonometry. So labeling the sides of my triangle, the side opposite 30, side opposite, the side opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse, and the remaining side is the adjacent side. So for me to find the side opposite 
given information for a JSON, I'm going to use tan data. So tan data is equal to side opposite all over side of JSON. Theta is 30 degrees, so it's tan 30 is equal to the side opposite, which is uh, uh, yz all over the adjacent side, which is 10 meters. I can cross multiply this point, so I'm going to get yz is equal to 10 multiplied by tan 30 degrees, or 10 tan 30 degrees, whose answer is uh, e. So this brings us to the end of this exercise. I hope you all benefited from this exercise. Uh, remember, more material will be sent to Moyo's Mac. Moyo Mac, don't forget to like, to subscribe, and share. All right, more material will be sent. So stay tuned, stay posted, and look out for the next. Take care.